Hey, everybody. What's going on? Welcome to another edition of the Bituation Room podcast live stream show thing. And it goes on um, after lots of turkey, too much turkey, in fact. Turkey meant for uh, a dozen people and enjoyed by three in my house. And uh, anyone got a good uh, turkey recipe, please DM me. Thank you. I uh, hope everyone had good holidays if you celebrate or um, if you just just chill or just like are forced to watch Jingle all the way. And you're like, this movie actually sucks. Anyway, um, I'm so excited to have you here. This is our last show of the year. Last show of the year. Looking forward to a very good 2023 and just thankful for you all who have made it so good um, for the community that grows, for the fact that like we're 500 subscribers shy of 40,000 on YouTube. And wouldn't it be just such a great late Christmas resident if we reached 40,000 subscribe? Um, also make sure to, uh, rate this show on iTunes, uh, helps people discover it again, the independent bituation room. That's right. Wolf Blitzer is not backed by Lockheed Martin. All right. Not, not yet. I mean, you know, if they name a fighter jet after me. We'll see. No, uh, obviously I would never accept that. It depends on how much money it was. Um, please make sure to give this podcast five stars. We've got such a good show. Rounding out the year, comedian Gareth Reynolds is here fresh off from taping his special. So excited. Everyone must watch when that comes out. Um, and uh, my mentor and good friend, Max Elbaum, who has just finished editing or this year has edited a, a new compilation of essays and strategic um, uh, like essays sorry i was trying to think of a different word strategic essays about grassroots electoral work um what that means for the future of this country what the 2020 election meant what the 2022 election meant i want to get his thoughts also on ukraine he is the master of all of the things he will he's the nostradamus of the left i've said this before max elbaum is here um and we're gonna bring him in and i and i want everyone to pay close a goddamn attention okay Thank you. Um, but a reminder, we also have bonus content every single episode. And today we're going to look at some military fails, y'all. There's some two, two very fun stories, you know, fun in a like, you know, after I stopped crying, then I found a moment to laugh kind of fun. Um, one out of Russia. You don't want to miss it. And uh, one about uh, the good old F-35. Lockheed Martin, again, I don't want it. Um, the F does not stand for Francesca. Okay? It's not the Francesca 35, all right? It'd be the Francesca 25. Um, but <laughs> you want to stick around for that. And by stick around, I mean you want to become part of the Frantifa officially. Patreon.com slash Bituation Room is where you go to do that. Two bucks, five bucks, ten bucks, baby. Uh, gets you a shout out and supports this show and puts food into my body, which then puts food into my baby's body. And then my baby puts poo poo in the diaper and then the diaper go. Anyway, the point is the content just keeps on spawning. Um, so thank you so much, uh, everyone who is part of that. And, um, if you didn't know, the Bituation Room is going to be live in San Francisco for SF Sketch Fest on January 22nd at 8 p.m. at Piano Fight Bar. Get your tickets, sfsketchfest.com. My guess, it's an all-white guy lineup. So I know, look, it's about damn time. You know what I'm saying? Uh, for far too long, the white man has been downtrodden. And I will lift them up on this show uh, because John Iderola of The Damage Report NATO Green of this show, of The Bugle, of labor organizing, and of stand-up comedy, as well as the host of the Behind the Bastards podcast, Robert Evans, are all of my guests. Oh my God, it's going to be so much fun. So please get over there, get your tickets. We'll all be masked. Everyone's going to be safe. Don't spit in my face. I mean, obviously it'd be like happy spit, but still, I don't want it. Um, get your tickets, come out. It'll be so, so, so much fun. I'm leaving my baby behind and, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna just party, babe. I mean, I don't know what we're talking about. 
TBD. Uh, I got a lot of work to do, but get, get your tickets. And with that, you guys, one last bitch of the year 2022. This is what are you? Let me find the interstitial bitching about. By the way, we're going to have new music in the year 2023. Treat. What? Yeah. I got so excited. I couldn't even say it. We've got new music, y'all. It is dropping in the new year. So anyone who misses the sort of like crazy drunken piano, um, you know, thank your boy Kevin McLeod and, uh, and all of his wiles. Uh, he doesn't even know. And when he finds out, he will sue me. And we'll, it'll be a whole thing. We'll be like, bro, but I shouted you out that one time. Anyway, there will be new music in the new year. Very excited. Uh, a good friend of mine has been working on that. So stay tuned. What am I bitching about? Very, very quickly before I bring in Gareth. Um, it's awful to me uh, that 20 people have died in a massive snowstorm. Uh, no, excuse me. I think 30 people have died in a massive snowstorm in western New York and the surrounding area. Uh, so, yes, I know people are battling with canceled flights, but uh, it gets a lot worse than that. And it's not tragic. For me, the tragedy is that these are folks who were going out to, like, get groceries. And, yeah, they were told not to. That's fine. But if you're looking at the next few days of being snowed in and you don't have any food, you might attempt to do that. I'm bitching about the fact that we have no climate preparedness in this country and that it shouldn't always be on honestly, it shouldn't be on the cops, hashtag defund the police, and fund climate preparedness. And emergency workers are doing what they can, but still, for me, 30 people dead from a snowstorm is too many. I know it's an unprecedented snowstorm, but these things are only going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. That is what I am bitching about. But what warms my little heart and the fact that I am now a mother and being a mom or a parent basically it does something to your emotional, it, your hormones are fucked is what I'm trying to say. It's like you just have the last scene to Homeward Bound playing in your head over and over and over again. You just cry all the time for no reason. And this storm has led to these beautiful acts of solidarity. Um, there was like a stranded bus of um, Korean tourists who were taken in by a couple and they all like cooked food together. And it was like a Merry Christmas. And then... Um, and then a, a man, a mentally disabled man was found by some neighbors and he was like, he was like about to be dead basically. And they took him in and they like warmed him up and they gave him a bath and they like had to cut like grocery bags from his hands because his hands were frozen. And, uh, uh. and so what I'm saying is I'm bitching that we don't, I don't want to have to have these stories of like goodwill, but the goodwill still exists. I would like us to get to a point where we have more preparedness. We know what's going to happen. There should be food delivered to everyone. Nationalize Amazon. Um, and Jeff Bezos can freeze in the goddamn cold. That's what I want to say. And with that, uh, let me bring in for the rest of this show. He is a comedian, a producer, a writer, an actor, a co-host of the podcast, that honestly has been keeping me going. Uh, the dollop. And his special, England Weed and the Rest, is now out on YouTube. Now out on YouTube, Gareth Reynolds. Hello. Hello. It's nice to be brought in after such heartwarming subject matter. It's just... Is that... Feels good. Is that sarcasm or... Is that... No, no. I like the, <laughs> the country's not working. I think that's good. <laughs> that's good to me. Yeah. I do um, think that, I think I like being, I've been snowed in like twice. Yeah. And uh, I enjoyed it because it's very much like, it's like, uh, you know, you sit down and you just think about, yeah. think about things. Well, that's, that's like, it depends. It really, it's always about like how, you know, what is your personal situation? If you have, if you've like, you know, got enough money to get through it then it's like the 2020 the pandemic like i'll be like man i really enjoyed that year and people will be like yeah my parents passed away and i'm like i mean it's a shame but like i just chill <laughs> I, was like, I, I was about a year to say off. it was like the pandemic no for for thirsty ass comics like us it was like 
no, you don't have to hustle no longer. Shh, yeah. sweet child. Like it it sucked. Like, cause I wasn't out working, but I was also like, I cannot go do my job in a way that feels like safe. Not not like now where I feel like it's fine, obviously. <laughs> um <laughs> But, you know, then there's people who are like, yeah, I'm like still working at the I'm still driving a bus. And you're like, right, that's tough. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, didn't think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm essential and I make seven dollars yeah. an hour. Ooh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. When we use the term essential instead of uh, surfs. But uh, <laughs> right. but yeah, I mean, I, I think what you're saying is totally true. It's like there there's so many, you know, there. And when you look at there's other stuff, there's other crazy things going on as far as like temperature fluctuations this uh oh god have been you know there's you're talking about like 40 degree drops in like an hour and people are like that's not normal mm -hmm. and um yeah and i i yeah i am i am with you i'm like okay feels like uh not gonna be a great uh future but here no. we go but here let's do this still still and yet they persisted <laughs> they held yet, out and some yet hope. somehow we find a way to continue to just be like, hey, it's gonna be it's USA. Hey, you USA. We'll uh, we'll shoot we'll a flag, flag at the weather. <laughs> we'll shoot a bunch of flags into the sun. Absolutely, keep the faith. You know, well, it's it's very much. And we're gonna talk about Bush later on, but it's when it's the, the moment. Band. It's the moment that W was told by like an a like a seventy year old woman that she had three jobs and he, is, without missing a beat, is like that's the American spirit. And you're like, no, it, no, that's the American problem. It's one of the greatest clips of all time, <laughs> yeah. and it also shows you while he was a total doofus moron pawn, he was pretty good at getting the bullshit out because he doesn't <laughs> wait too long. He doesn't go shit. That, this country's a total nightmare. He I just mean, goes, isn't that the American spirit right there? <laughs> it's just like, yeah, this woman's 70 and has three jobs. Isn't that unbelievable? She's a slave to a system that keeps fucking her. Isn't that great? <laughs> it's the most, like, gaslighting is, the t is like the word of the year, but Bush, the Bush administration was the ultimate gaslighters. And, like, I'm sure she never even thought of it that way. Like, oh, she just sort of goes home like, I am yeah, the American he dream. Her. We had to go into <laughs> Iraq because we were running out of gas to light. <laughs> Gareth, he, he was like, we need to find more gas. We're going to light this fuel. <laughs> Isn't that unbelievable that this woman's life is total shit? Isn't that, didn't that say America? <laughs> Gareth, what are you bitching about if not fluctuations in weather and lack well, of climate comparison. It's a shame because you talked about canceled flights and that's what I was going to bitch about. But you, were like, <laughs> you made that seem petty. Um, I uh, I mean, there's so much. I was, I yesterday was talking about um, how we should stop criticizing people's actions during the climate crisis. Like as far as like the dude who glued his face to the sidewalk. And, you know, I'm like, that oh, guy's yeah. off. But, you know, I feel like we should be a little more understanding to people freaking out and throwing soup on paintings and stuff. But I really do think the the year that uh, we've had as far as like aviation goes uh, and the airlines has been remarkable. Mm. And what, you, what is happening right now is incredible. And um, it just continues. I stopped flying pretty much. I take like I mean, I probably take a few flights a year at this point, but it is remarkable to watch how they just continue to screw people and continue to get money from the government. And we continue yes. to hear people say how it's okay. And, um, and there's no, there is no COVID. Like if you have COVID, you fly like just, there's yep. no, there's, and, and they're talking about getting one pilot in the cockpit instead of two. All these little <laughs> things God. are just sort of being jenga out of the system. As yep. we're kind of going like, yeah, we'll be able to get through it. That's and, such a uh, perfect way of describing it. They're re they're really going for those bottom two Jenga. Yeah, uh, and it's layers. wobbly. It's it would be like a viral video where you'd be like, how'd that guy get that block out? Like <laughs> we are like at that point where we're going, how's that thing still standing? And um, it is just a You're total getting... house of cards. Yeah, we're gonna be on a flight, and we're just gonna hear over the intercom, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is there a pilot on board yeah uh is any one of us a pilot a trained licensed or even a doctor does aviator? anyone feel who's played a lot of first person flying games yeah <laughs> i was at when i i mean this is 
two years ago or whatever, I was way, I, there was a time where they were just super honest about what was going on. And they just over the speaker said, you know, we're going to be delayed a little while. We're trying to find a pilot. And I was like, that is a remarkable thing to hear. <laughs> yeah. but they are like, we're just trying to figure out who could do it. Dude, I flew United recently and I didn't know that um like United first of all, don't don't at me about people who have the United card, they're so like oh United no, no United sucks, okay? United fucking sucks. I'll say that right now. Cause like yes. the standby list was like 30 people, and I'm like, oh no, Perfect. I'm Asian. I'm getting dragged out by my hands, dude. You're just I'm doing you're doing one of the things. You're gonna do it to me. I can feel it. They're like, do you want to give up your seat for five hundred dollars? And I'm like, no, not really. I'm like, wait, am I gonna get dragged out like that poor Asian man? I'm sorry. They're like, well, you can do the five hundred now, or we can drag you out when you're in your seat. What would you rather? <laughs> yeah, like, um, we'll drag you out by, by your feet for just a hundred dollars. Um, yeah, they were they were like they made me. They were like, you can only have one carry on and it's a hundred dollar ticket. And I was like, are you fucking out? A hundred dollars for your carry on? Well, it was a cheap, it was a cheap ticket, all things considered. Right. I'm saying. And Still. then they, but the fine print is of you can only have one carry on and you don't get an electronic boarding ticket. I'm like, who is this saving? Oh, you don't get an electronic it's boarding crazy. ticket. So you got a fucking, like, what is, the fuck's wrong with you? I know all these things that you just assume are like, they they well they're also going to start to charge for carry-ons. They do that. Uh, they're they're going to start doing that too. I, I was reading this oh, thing yeah. about it recently, and they were like, "Always have a brown paper bag with you, just so you can because then you can pretend it's food." I'm like, this is like not okay. The way that we keep kind of finding our little ways to mull around the problems when it's just like, how about if they just stop, just stop them. Someone stop them. Like someone's eaten real good. Like the food chain of airlines, because it's not going to the to any oh, uh, air CEOs. flight attendants. It's not going no. to pilots. Oh, it's see, not going no. anywhere. It's just, but like, how many homes can you buy if you can't even fly to them because your fucking systems are so janky? It's just like, ugh. No, it's no, true. They, I, they keep they keep finding, and they they are shrinking the seat. I mean, everything. They are just. <laughs> They're going to, yeah, they, I saw this one picture of like this, I guess, hypothetical airline plan where there are raised seats and then lowered seats. Oh God. And so essentially you're asking some people's faces to be in asses and to them, they're like, and that's so that your legs can fully go out so that you can sort of be like kind of eld with your head in ass. So some people, just... when there's turbulence, they'll just be like, mm -hmm. yeah, well, it'll be, it'll be a little, <laughs> it won't be, it's not right above your head. It's just, it's just literally in front of your head. So yes, any sort of anything that is too turbulent, you could very easily be pounding, but it's, um, but look, I mean, it was a $55 flight. So it's, and that is what you'll do. You'll go, Hey, I didn't know why it was so cheap. Ryanair in Ireland tried to do standing up flights and oh someone my was like, God. someone was like, we can't do that. <laughs> so it was, it was definitely uh, like the secretary bringing in water and be like, that sounds terrible. I'm sorry. It's just I'm a sorry, regular just human. Here. That's torture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, that's a good point. Denise. Thank, thank you, you, Grace. Now <laughs> leave the tease. I've got to find a new one. <laughs> All right, we got to move on to this week. Uh, arguably less fun. I don't know. Uh, we're talking about the omnibus spending bill, and we're talking about Zelensky speaking in front of Congress. But first, uh, let's let's dig into a few things that I wrote down. Yes, I did have some extra time. I can't promise much, but this week. The January 6th committee released its final report, which ends with some recommendations that include criminal prosecution of former President Trump, enforcing Article 14, Section 2 of the Constitution to forbid those who aid insurrection from holding office and being OK with shooting white people. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe we should do that. Could have. Sounds fine. Sounds like maybe we should do that. <laughs> as, as a white, I'm in. <laughs> Greg Abbott pulled yet another stunt, uh, nearly as good as him surviving that tree that fell on him years ago, only to become a villain on wheels by sending yet another bus of migrants to President Kamala Harris's home, Vice President Kamala Harris's home on Christmas Eve in freezing temperatures 
without adequate clothing or blankets. Now, if you're mad at me for calling him a villain on wheels, tough shit, okay? I believe in ableism for the evil. That's right. Greg, Greg Abbott is a four-wheel drive sack of shit. A red-pilled Professor X. Greg Abbott, God missed with that tree, okay, bro? That's all I have to say. Uh, Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene apparently are not on good terms anymore. Um, Boebert said that she this doesn't... This is tough. Yeah, it's so sad. Bober said she doesn't agree with Marjorie on a lot of things like the Jewish space lasers. And we all know what happened. They were having a sleepover and it was Marjorie's turn to let Lauren sleep with the cardboard cutout of Donald Trump and she wouldn't let go of it. And Lauren cried all night. Um, uh, I've read a lot of stuff about people think that the Jewish space laser is what hit the tree that fell on Abbott. Just, <laughs> that it was that predetermined. <laughs> God damn it. No, if if they are real, they wouldn't have missed. Um, a New York Republican, finally, a New York Republican congressman, George Santos, is in hot water for having lied about everything. <laughs> this guy's this guy's my hero of 2022. No, seriously, he this snuck guy. in there before 2022 was over. So he this claimed guy. to have been a college grad, Jewish, gay, uh, and to own 13 properties. But it turns out he never went to college was married to a woman once, is Catholic, and most loathsome of all, is a renter. Um, still, to his credit, Santos doesn't hawk the big lie about 2020. Instead, he just hawks many little itty-bitty ones. Lots well, did you hear the thing, too, about how they were like, uh, you said you were Jewish. And he said, I said I was Jew-ish. Ish. Like the TV show Black, -ish. I'm Jewish. <laughs> The ish is in italics. My people use that term. And by that, I mean Catholics. <laughs> just amazing work. Uh, just mm, this guy. It doesn't even, all he's got to do is be like, uh, and Q is Lord. And everyone's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, and now everyone's like, you can't do it. Like, but his point is everybody lies. So you're kind of like, I, he's not even He's fully not wrong. wrong. All right, we got to get into uh, everything else for the week where. So this was the week where the House passed the let's fund the government for a little bit longer, shall we, Bill, uh, leaving it to President Biden to sign. Um, and it's a rare opportunity for Democrats who are currently, uh, although not for long, in control of both chambers uh, to use a lame duck session and pass like critical parts of their agenda before they lose the ma majority in the House. So did they? <laughs> a little bit, a lot of, a little bit of, a little bit of good and a lot of bit of you shoulda, woulda, coulda. Um, so let's go into what was good and actually coming out of that January 6th commission recommendations. Um, there's legislation in this omnibus bill that clarifies the vice president's role in overseeing certification, uh, saying like, n no, you it's just it's just ceremonial. There's a set of stipulations designed to make it harder for there to be any confusion over the accurate slate of electors from each slate. You just there to you. Know, it's like ringing the bell for the stock market. You don't yeah. own the stock market then. Yeah. I also think that the Demo I, I think it would be smart for I think all that is smart to put in because obviously <laughs> I don't know if you remember we had a bit of a situation. But um I think the Democrats should let they should not try to box Trump out. He's on such a down. If I, I would be like, let him run, let him be let that's the it's their time. They did a lot of like funding candidates that would totally lose in they the did. 2020 prime. Like I would do that. I would let Trump go over DeSantis. I think DeSantis a much more scary person who will do not, not as far as being president, but I think a much bigger threat to beating uh, an 80 year old man whose eyes don't open. Anymore. <laughs> okay. Counterpoint. We did that in 2016. And uh, yeah. <laughs> he's, he, I, I feel like he had his jump the shark with his uh, little NFTs. He's because I think he, I really feel I mean, again, you're it would be great if the Democrats were like, why don't we just have a great candidate? 
But instead, you're really kind of hedging your bets over like, who's going to like make Joe Biden look the worst? Trump, I feel like is he's now he's more of like a Trump cover band than the original Trump. That's very true. We have plenty of time to discuss DeSantis v. Trump, but at least there's some money in this omnibus spending bill, Gareth, which is what we're talking about, which I know you're excited about. Um, There is funding for two point six billion for U.S. attorneys that include efforts to fund Uh, prosecutions related to the January 6th attack on the Capitol uh, and domestic terrorism cases, according to a fact sheet from the House Appropriations Committee. There's $11.3 billion to the FBI in investigating extremist violence and domestic terrorism. And of course, that will be spent wisely. Not at all used to surveil shows like this one. What does it not include? Okay. No more child tax credit. There was a a, a, um, a measure to bring that back. Uh, sadly, not there. Co- corporate and individual tax breaks did not make the final bill. Neither did legislation to allow cannabis companies to bank their cash reserves, um, known as the Safe Banking Act, or a bill, and this one is particularly fucked, to help Afghan evacuees in the U.S. gain lawful permanent residency. You know, they can just be swept up by ICE. Uh, and the spending package did also did not include a White House request for roughly $10 billion in additional COVID funding for the COVID-19 response or, uh, yeah, funding for the COVID-19 response, which is like, no, it's, it's, I mean, it's, a, we're always talking about so much money, but $10 billion in this bill is nothing. And you can't even get that. A 1.7 trillion in total. And yet a stipulation that came out of the pandemic was basically you can't kick people off of Medicaid, um, not in during a pandemic, which is like, OK, there's some like the the minimal heart you can have. And uh, that and that's holding right. That's still. Is gone. Damn. <laughs> that is, Damn. Yep. So the continuous coverage measure enacted as part of COVID-19 relief passed in March 2020 and has led to 90 million Medicaid enrollees. Uh is no longer uh, in place. So it will, there's no law that will phase, basically recipients can be kicked off of it. Up to 19 million people could lose their Medicaid benefits, although many would be eligible for other coverage. Sure, uh, CNN. For sure, for sure. Yeah, come over sure. here. Come to Cobra. It's going to be great. <laughs> we come promise. Oh, this, it's just my, it's my Cobra snake. <laughs> We named it Cobra because it's really good for you. And- yeah. Aren't you, little one? <laughs> Which is fucking yeah. the worst, the worst. Like I also was reading that uh, of the 19 million people, it's it's mainly, you know, people of color who are going to be affected. It's like continuing. In other words, Democrats. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> right. Yeah. But it it's really, it is shocking that it, is this abysmal? I mean, when you look at the, which I'm sure you'll get into the amount of defense spending Mm -hmm. versus the amount of actual money there is for the rest, it would be like if you, like if you were in a house and your dad was in charge of the finances and he put 90% of everything towards the man cave and you're like, (laughs) dad, we don't have cereal. You'd be like, we got to make the man cave better. Just be like, yeah, but dad, we need like, I don't have any, my clothes, I can't fit in my shoes anymore. He'd be like, I'm going to get more stuff in the man cave. Yeah, exactly. I, I need a, well, you know, one of those little foot massagers with like, you put the little fish. I've got the mini fish and you put them in and, and they the eat fish. the dead skin off my feet. I've got about $200,000 carved out for flashlights for the man cave. <laughs> it's the man cave budget. Yeah. No, the military is effectively our man cave. Um, it does not make us safer. I think man caves are actually would make us more safer if we invested. I've got in an, cave. I've got an, uh, I'm going to add on something to this uh, comparison. You're not allowed to go into the man cave. Oh, no. So not you just all. keep hearing about how great the man cave is doing and all the stuff we're putting into the man cave, but you can't. The man cave is bringing democracy to the world, you know? Yes. And every time we audit the man cave, it fails. Oh, every time. But that's okay because, you know, the America. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to that end, $858 billion for military spending, 45 billion more than proposed. Which Some of that also just the crazy. <laughs> Who's tipping? Why are we <laughs> tipping the military? Hey, a little something for yourself. Hey, here you go. Get yourself something nice. There you go. 
What are we doing? <laughs> That's exactly what it is. But maybe it's going to a good place. Uh, we're talking $45 billion in assistance to Ukraine and NATO allies. Um, and in addition, there's... Um, Sorry, this it includes an overhaul of electoral vote counting, um, an uh, uh, excuse me, an overhaul of the electoral vote counting law, protections for pregnant workers, an enhancement of retirement savings rules, and a TikTok ban on federal devices. Let's pull that apart. So, forty-five billion, maybe that's the tip, um, you know, that Gareth is talking about. Protections for pregnant workers, yes, they're very, very cool, and things that oh my god, I can't believe we're not in place. But things like the Pump Act, which stipulates that. Uh, employers have to guarantee uh, their workers have a safe, quiet, seated place to actually like pump breast milk, you know? Um, also, so that pregnant workers don't have to like do manual labor and be and run the risk of being pregnant. I mean, if you're going to force people into pregnancy, like tens of millions of women currently are forced in their states uh, since the overturning of Roe v. Wade and all of these draconian laws, you might as well make it a little bit fucking easier for them to be your forced birthers. Um, and as someone who is pumping and just pumped right before the show, I've got a lot of sympathy because I'm like, has anyone died from like their breasts exploding? Because it's very painful. If you don't know, Gareth. Oh, I know. It's painful when your boobs are full of milk and then it's just like, I wonder, like, I'm about to, as a parent, all you do is Google things nowadays. You're just like, yeah. can baby die from cry? You know, like, um, but it's always misspelled. <laughs> I like, can baby die from cry? <laughs> yeah. that's, I've that's, Googled that. How long before baby die? Um, yeah. There's, there's a lot of that. And, like, one of them is, like, can die from breasts exploding. Anyway, I'm glad the pump act is in there. Yeah, it, it. It's again, they have to put that stuff in there. Otherwise, it's all irredeemable. And it that's true. is that's why they may they they are adding those. It's like I I'm gonna punch you in the face, but here's five dollars and a lollipop. <laughs> so you're like, uh, oh, thank you. I don't know how to react to this necessarily. But it really doesn't help that I mean, those are again, like you're saying, they're no brainers, but they are there so that you get thrown off the scent a little bit. And it is yeah. what separates the Democrats from the Republic. It's these marginal, minor victories that make you go, OK, yes, you are slightly better than these nightmare fascists who are lurking around the corner. Absolutely. But the whole problem is if they don't do too enough of that, they're going to lose more and more people. They could do loads of it and stack the deck against Trump, DeSantis, whoever's coming. But instead, they're really just kind of hedging bets. And that's what these things are. They're just like, yes, you're right. Women should obviously have safe places to do all that stuff. The idea that, like, obviously, it's not OK to be like, you're pregnant and raising it. You're fired. Like, that should not be OK. And it happens all the time. And Sorry. It's <laughs> commonplace. Yeah, totally. But within that. I mean, how much fucking money do we need to spend on this defense budget? No, exactly. And like, like, you know, 45 billion, take it from somewhere else. I, you know, I do believe in actually funding Ukraine in this war. I do. I, I don't think it should be unchecked. I respect those, the Congress people who voted against it. And we're going to talk about that. But Take it from somewhere else in the fucking Pentagon, man. Take it from somewhere else in the, in the defense money. Can we buy Ukraine? How much? <laughs> I would. They should just put a nut. Like, how much is it to buy it? <laughs> We've got to be close to being able to buy it at this point. Let's just buy it. Let's just buy the place. <laughs> we need to and then stop, put a like, bunch of motels this. or hotels it's, and little houses like on it. And then if you payment. land on it, you got to pay. It pays for itself at the end. Yeah, it's monopoly like a rules. Payment. Where after like a three or four year lease, you're like, I should have just bought it. <laughs> like, we should just buy it. You're basically saying if the analogy is 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 to be followed, that we go to war. You ready to? We you are ready, at you're, war. You're, you're ready to put weird. No, but you you gotta war. go, Gareth. You gotta go personally. Listen, you want me over there doing this. <laughs> I you want me. I'll have you need me over there. I'll be like, I'll be really helpful. They'll just keep being like, where is he? And I'll be like in a hole. Like, He's doing crowd I, work. My, 
I'm just trying to crowd for it. <laughs> hey, you guys got big guns. You guys like big guns? I got two big guns for All right, come on, guys. Let's loosen up. Let's lighten up, everybody. Come on. <laughs> but we're already fighting the war. We're fighting a very sort of strange little war where we're like, we're giving them missiles. And Russia's like, okay, I suppose you can give missiles and not be directly engaged. Like, yeah. it's no, very it is. Strange. We're hanging a lot on the mental well-being of Vladimir Putin, which is uh, yeah. shaped. Which is very, very not, shaky. Not great for a man who's known to shove people out of windows for a little. No, thing. but so there's the spending. And even though she says she supported things like the Pump Act and other other um, and basically things that protected pregnant workers that were kind of one of the better things in this bill, in addition to the protections, electoral protections. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez voted no and was the only Democrat to vote no on the omnibus spending bill, saying, I campaign on a promise to my constituents to oppose additional expansion and funding for ICE and DHS, particularly in the absence of long overdue immigration reform. For that reason, as well as the dramatic increase in defense spending, which even exceeds President Biden's request, I voted no on today's omnibus bill. So that, you know, the DHS and is effectively... I don't know if it's separate from the CIA money, but there's a lot of like intelligence money. Now, yes. I would argue For I think a country it, it, this stupid. <laughs> exactly. You're throwing good good money after bad at this point. Yeah. And you are, you are. I think that the FBI, look, I'm someone who believes that an intelligence agency should exist, but I believe in remaking it from the ground fucking up. Yeah, I don't let's think try. Yeah, why don't we let's try a new? Yes. Like, you know, take Twenty thousandth. That was a yeah. Line. Well, the whole thing is we would need to make it outside of the government, and you know, here right. we are again with the like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's essentially like we're the we like it's it's constantly us talking about things we need to do to the country club that we're not members of that we work for, <laughs> and you know, it's like that's all we end up doing. But yeah, I think her the whole thing with. Uh, Ocasio Cortez and anyone in the squad is I sort of felt like when they were first kind of forming and it felt like they were kind of a group, it felt like there was going to be some sort of strategy that we kind of had yeah. a like a cell inside of the Democratic Party that was going to be able to, with their solidarity, make moves and have a, 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 an angle. And instead, it's just scattershot where Ilhan Omar will vote against one thing and then Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez will vote against it and Rokana. And they so they independently every now and then do little moves. But mm -hmm. there is no organization. And I believe by design, because they are, again, the Democratic Party is the blob that just absorbs any sort of movement just to sort of keep the stasis that keeps them rich. Yes, yes, exactly. I think that getting it is it is like step five on a 50 point plan to make socialism <laughs> um, and like make real change is like getting into power, you know, uh, and then yeah. they have to campaign every two fucking years. But I believe that Nancy Pelosi pushes AOC up and gets in the wall and say, you think you're pretty little girl. You think you're going to come in here and you yeah. think you're going to do oh, what you're going to do. Revolution. You're going to do progressivism. You're going to do woke? I think are you going to do think, no you're going to eat my ice cream and you're going to like it you're going to stay in your place and you know like she is don't get it twisted there is some mean girl shit happening in the congress and they're like if oh you're going to do some shit well, you get no committee positions don't think that I wouldn't put you in a goddamn corner cuz you're a baby and babies go in a corner that's what I happened. think that she's trying to make a coat out of the progressives that's what I think <laughs> Um, I think I, it's hard totally. is what I'm trying to say. I think it's hard. It's totally I think it's hard. hard. It, but there were at the beginning, she was like, I'm going to go sit in Nancy Pelosi's office about the green new deal. And I like, know. Holy and that shit, was, I know. I this. know. I was never and forgive though. So far removed from that now that it's like, it's that all, was again, never the term, forgive. The term progressive has been usurped now as well. And you just go, well, God damn it. We got to come up with another name. Like, how many times do we have to just keep renaming this shit where it's like, fuck the system? 
Right. But we keep having to be like, all right, we're not progressives. We're rejectives. We reject you, you know, <laughs> and then rejectives will win. And then and then you'll have like the Nancy Pelosi air just going like, I'm a rejective. And you're like, well, fuck it. That just jumped the shark, too. <laughs> That's a brilliant encapsulation of political co-optation by Gareth Reynolds, everybody. Um, before we bring in Max uh, to talk some strategy about 2020 and 2022 and going forward, I did want to watch this clip and, and then I'll bring Max in to talk about it. But um, this was also the week where um, Vladimir Zelensky, the good Vlad uh, of Ukraine, spoke in front of the United States Congress, which was pretty unprecedented. Honestly, uh, this does not happen often. The other times I remember foreign leaders speaking on Congress in the Congress uh, was when. Uh, Netanyahu was invited by fucking Republicans to speak during the amazing. Obama administration and was like, um, we all know he was born in Africa. You know what I mean? He was just the most racist shit. Yeah. Um, so, Which is a rare look for Netanyahu. Yeah, exactly. Usually he's, you know, incredibly Super progressive. Yes. Uh, yeah. He's the most progressive, really. No, so uh, he spoke to Congress he um, I wrote something for this people. Um, former comedian Vladimir Zelensky spoke to the U.S. Congress in a pretty unprecedented address. He wore a brown sweatsuit and spoke with a thick accent, but he kind of crushed it in a whopping 28 minute address uh, that honestly for a set had like more clapter than like real laughter, you know, and like as a comic, it's like, like a bringer show where you brought your family. Totally. A little bit of a bringer show vibes, but that's okay. Uh, it still was a good set. Um, he talked about the Ukrainian resolve to win the war. He talked about their sacrifice. He thanked uh, Congress for money, basically. It was like, this is well spent. Do Basically, like, don't even for a moment think that we are not grateful and this is not well spent. And he kind of had that Ukrainian, like, look you in the eyes and be like, I will fight for my country until my very last breath. And you're like, I've never felt that way about anything ever. Yeah. Definitely the not way, my country. Could you give me some money to get new clothes? Yeah. <laughs> I only I'm... have one outfit. <laughs> <laughs> but the part that I that struck me, and I think that is the most interesting to talk about, is when he kind of he spoke about this war in a way I don't think we've heard anyone speak about it certainly not President Biden speaking about this war as kind of like a a battle for democracy a battle for what kind of future do we want do we want a future where um, countries can invade their neighbors and they just kind of take them over and do we want authoritarianism do we want the likes of Vladimir Putin or do we want like democracy international cooperation you know the prospect of joining something like the EU or NATO, I mean, NATO is a military operation and I have very conflicted thoughts about it, especially anyway. But so it was an interesting moment and I kind of just want to play it for you. It, it was moving and we could talk about it. This battle cannot be frozen or postponed. It cannot be ignored, hoping that the ocean or something else will provide a protection from the United States to China, from Europe to Latin America, and from Africa to Australia, the world is too interconnected and interdependent to allow someone to stay aside and at the same time to feel safe when such a battle continues. Our two nations are allies in this battle. And next year will be a turning point I know it, the point when Ukrainian courage and American resolve must guarantee the future of our common freedom, the freedom of people who stand for their values. How great would it have been if Pelosi just ripped up his speech? <laughs> it's like in a move, in a just a goodbye forever move. <laughs> just, I'm done. I'm oh, hammered. What? Oh, it did. It only worked at one time. Yeah. Fuck you, AOC. You told me this would work again. <laughs> I Fuck will make you. a coat from you. <laughs> yeah. um, Nearly have a hood. Um, yeah. He's so a, he's a great speaker. He's a great. I mean, he. You know, you. There is no doubt that he is like a sympathetic and 
um, engaging figure. I mean, my issues do not even necessarily lie specifically with this, but it's like the American government and the American military system cherry pick where they want democracy, where they choose to highlight uh, problems and where they choose to ignore or even fuel fires for problems. Yes. And so it's or like make things the, worse. <laughs> Yes. I mean, we we do not support democracy in many countries. If you look in South America, we despise democracy. When mm -hmm. it comes to countries that have oil, we reject their democracies all the time. Yes. So, you know, I Who have oil and want to keep the money from the oil. We're great with them yeah. having oil as long as we get the money. Yes, and the that's oil. what I should. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> like you can do drugs as long as I can hold the bag. Yeah. Um, so, you and know, that's it's... what people have have been pointing out and they've been pointing out this whole time. And especially, I think, progressives and the left, if that has a meaning, but is that hypocrisy um, and and also the ways in which Ukrainian refugees have been welcomed with open arms and it is not lost on anyone that they are white. Uh, and it is important to know that while he calls out the rest of the world, a lot of Latin American countries have not been really supportive of this war, I have not thrown down with Ukraine um, necessarily. They've been kind of honestly a little bit on the fence. And I, you know, it is important to point out Russia for all their problems, they were giving their like kind of crap vaccine out. Um, they were handing that out. I think they charged for it, but they like gave this Sputnik vaccine to Latin American countries very, very soon after they had developed it in 2020. The United States, Pfizer, uh, fucking uh, Moderna, you think they got any vaccines? Hell fucking no, they got vaccines. They did not give vaccines. The United the United States leading on that research, that, that, that research did not benefit the health and well-being of Latin American countries. So there is, you know, I'm not saying Russia is like, a god in in the minds of Latin Americans or 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 African nations, but there's more soft power. There's and less like we're just gonna put a base in your fucking country, and uh, yeah. you're gonna be safe, right? So that stuff adds up. That that over time, you you know that is how I mean th these things add up, and future generations will be like, you know, Russia did this, and if you say Russia is a villain who we sh who should be despised. Don't leave the lane where they can do these sort of things. Right. So Juan Cole, who's been on this show before, uh, had pointed out um, this exact thing. Virtually no country in Africa, Asia, or the Middle East has rallied to Biden's cause of defending Ukraine. The lack of enthusiasm has many roots, but one of them is a strong sense that the U.S., as Gareth mentioned, is not principled on this issue and is merely pursuing a narrow national interest. They do not see Washington as actually upholding the rules-based international order, and they are correct in this assessment. And it's part of a larger piece where he argues that uh, the Syrian, former Syrian Golan Heights annexed by Israel. Just uh, who? What? I'm sorry. United States has nothing to say about that. Does not pressure Syria around that. Does not uphold international law when um, belligerent nations want to invade their neighbors um, and annex their territory. We're sort of mum on that, and especially when it comes to Israel. But to weigh in on this, and particularly that th this dance we do, where we want to defend, uh, you know, Ukrainian human rights and against an authoritarian like like um, like Putin, but also all of these contradictions. The United States being that person, you know, that that entity to give all the money and weapons. Is Max Elbaum, member of a student member of Students for a Democratic Society, now on the editorial board of Convergence magazine, the author of Revolution in the Air, 60s Radicals Turned to Lenin, Mao, and Che, and the newest book, Power Concedes Nothing: How Grassroots Organizing Wins Elections, which is out right now. Max, welcome to the program once again. Thanks. Nice to be here. Interesting listening to you to dissect modern politics. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like a like there was a little shade there. Like interesting, uh, you guys trying to dissect modern politics. <laughs> now, no, but uh, truly, Max, you as someone who I've looked to for many years on these issues, especially in foreign policy, and I know that's not what the book is about. But what is your take on Ukraine now, going into almost a year of this war, and the United States' support for it, and this? Um, I think our honest reactions about like, man, how much more money are we going to fund this war while we still can't get COVID funding in this country? 
Uh, no, I meant I meant my comment sincerely. I think you've pointed out in the course of the last few minutes uh, what a complicated and contradictory situation we're facing here. I mean, this this war, it's a human disaster and it's a global political disaster. Uh, and there's no simple things. And there's also, we're living in a world where there's not pure good guys and pure bad guys. It's the, the, the you know, this is, the, you know, the American way of thinking about things that something is all good, all bad. That's not going to fly in this right. situation. So obviously Zelensky is tapped into, you know, you have to put ourselves in the situation of people who live in small countries that have been uh, bullied by larger countries for generations, for centuries. Uh, there's a certain uh, sense of uh, na their national or community interest uh, and that deserves to be respected. And they don't want to be pushed around anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. And Zelensky is an excellent spokesman for that part of the Ukrainian uh, position on this, which is we've been pushed around and we're not going to be pushed around anymore. And we're going to stand up for ourselves. And we're going to take help from wherever we can get it because we're fighting a war for our national survival. That's a very compelling narrative. And to the extent that that's what the narrative is, that's fine. I agree with mm -hmm. that. You should support mm -hmm. that. But there's plenty of other parts of this that then that leaves out if it's only seen through that prism, which is right. the other part. We do live in an interconnected world. He's absolutely right about that. And this war is going to make more. We, we live in a world where wars create global disasters. This one has created a global food disaster, a global climate change disaster. And it's given the hegemonic imperial power, the United States, an excuse to wrap itself in the guise of being for peace and democracy, just like you all just pointed out, the level of hypocrisy when on a global stage, uh, the United States is certainly as much responsible or more than anyone else of preventing international cooperation around fighting climate change, around dealing with global pandemics, around dealing with the tremendous economic inequality, vaccine apartheid, uh, mm -hmm. and all the hypocrisy. The problem for the U.S. left right now is we're not a player in this. I mean, we can fight with each other all day about how much to empathize emphasize how bad the Russian invasion is, how much to emphasize the problems of the U.S. military industrial complex and what the U.S. is using as an excuse, uh, wrapping itself in the justness of the Ukrainian cause to justify all kinds of unjust behavior in many other parts of the world, uh, including its own ambitions in Eastern Europe, uh, which are not for the good of the Eastern European peoples although it's understandable why at this point, a lot of the Eastern European peoples, not just in the Ukraine, uh, look to the West because they've been, mm -hmm. they've been bullied uh, from the East over the last uh, few decades or centuries. So right. we're, we're in a pretty difficult situation. And as you were talking about in terms of the electoral arena, the amount of power that we have and the amount of coherence that we have to exercise what power we do have is quite limited right now. Right. So our problem is our problem is how to get to the point where we're a player again. Uh, we, we're a player on some issues, on so-called domestic issues. We actually are a player. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the alliance right now that exists between Bernie and the squad and the Biden people, which is real, and has actually mm -hmm. affected politics. There's some weight that the left has exercised through that. And totally. you pointed out much of the limits of that weight with the omnibus bill and all kinds of other things. But it's a real force. It's not an accident that Biden's people talk to Bernie's people every week. And there's a measure of coordination. It's not all mean shit. That's part of it. Yeah. But they worked out a deal. Uh, and that's a partly a reflection. The deals always reflect. Uh, the balance of forces. It's just when so funny that the deals. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. It's just so funny that the deals are always like, um, <laughs> uh, 
help me sell out my own plan <laughs> that I proposed. <laughs> like Biden being like, okay, so I, I won't call it, we won't call it Build Back Better. And and the progressives are like, well, that wasn't even my, that's your title. And they're like, no, you're right. I, we just, we won't call it Build Back Better and I'll strip all of, like, it's like, it's like progressives are fighting more for the Biden agenda than Biden is himself, you know? Um, he's, he's his own worst enemy. And because he's balancing these other invisible or visible forces from the right, of course. Um, I guess with Ukraine, Max, I wanted to ask you, you know, comparing, it seems like on foreign policy, you know, yes, there's no plan from progressives. There's like abstention votes or voting no on extra money for Ukraine we Ukrainian weapons. You know, someone like Ilhan Omar who gets hammered um, when all she's saying is like, I just kind of want it accounted for. You know, I don't think it should be an endless fund. I am worried about the, the money. Um, that seems like a dead end on Ukraine, but there are some openings on, let's say, stopping funding to Saudi Arabia, right, for its war on Yemen and the ways that even some Republicans can be picked off to support bills like that. How, how do you see foreign policy strategy maneuvering in for progressives in Congress? I think the progressives in, co in Congress have a, a, an almost impossible job right now. Uh, my own evaluation of how they're doing is probably a little more positive than yours, given the constraints that they face. So they are working around trying to end the war in Yemen. Uh, the progressives are doing certain things even around Palestine, which has been a third rail in American politics for decades and decades. Uh, there is opposition to the Cold War, new Cold War policies against China. They're, so they are trying to work those things. I think their calculations have to do with um, what they think they can win. They pick their fights and they mm -hmm. pick the fights about where they think they can make a difference. And they also have to deal, as you pointed out, with the realities in their own districts and what's going to keep them in power. Uh, now, this is just a reality that you face if you're elected official. We... Uh, we don't, the grassroots folks, there's a creative tension that has to exist between our grassroots movements and the elected officials. We're not going to just fall in line behind everything they do. Uh, mm -hmm. We do have to push. That's the advantage of being on the outside. You're not accountable for the results. You can push the uh, values and you can. we can push our demands. And that's our job to push the envelope. So that feeling we have is a good feeling. That friction you're saying is a good friction. It's a, it's a fact of life until you have a situation where there is a coherent left force in a, in a parliamentary system where you can have a disciplined party vote and where you can hold your electoral people accountable and you can do so because you know you can deliver the goods if they uh, take a risky stance. Right. You know, it, the left's attitude you can't uh, you you can hold people accountable in it. what does that actually mean if you can't turn out the votes in the district uh, right. if you don't have an operation where you consult with people and then you say okay if you don't vote our way we're going to primary you and you're going to lose right. or we're going to support you if you can't deliver it's just hot air you know it's money to or, or it's even worse than that next I think it's even worse. I think it goes nihilistic and it can even go, you know, in the other direction where you're like, well, then I'm going to throw down with the Republican in this two party system. And you're like, well, that's fucking dumb. That's the worst yeah, take. Well, yet, you know, you know? You've got Tulsi Gabbard. If you want to talk about that kind of a direction, there's plenty of people <laughs> who have gone that direction, sure. which is, uh, you know, the hatred for the establishment, which, of course, we all believe is understandable and justified ends up turning into uh, a right-wing demagogic uh, kind of position that we've seen plenty of people go that route over many, many decades. Uh, right. Tulsi Gabbard is only one, of the, one of the latest. But, well, but the point uh, being that for the time being, for the immediate next future of American politics, there's gonna be a creative tension between the uh, grassroots movements and the elected officials who, like you said, turn themselves progressive. And you were even mentioned one of the high points of that, the, the uh, sit-in at Pelosi's office by sunrise 
and which ALC participated in. That was a big thing. And that was a great example of that kind of creative attention uh, because it did catapult the Green New Deal into the mainstream and it moved the Democratic Party. Even though the sit-in was at Pelosi's office, the main target was the climate change denialists in the Republican Party. Uh, right. But they managed to pull that off. And that was an extremely creative action. And it took place at a certain time and at a certain moment. Now, we have to look for those kinds of opportunities today. Uh, sometimes uh, they don't come along all the time. There's a bunch of things that come together. You know, uh, you look at the uh, my generation, those sit-ins in Woolworths in 1960 that went like wildfire against segregation and uh, built SNCC, uh, you know, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. People tried to do the same thing in the 19, late 1940s. There was uh, Freedom Riders across the South in 47, 48, 49. It didn't work. It didn't catch fire then because that was the beginning of the Cold War. McCarthyism was on the rise. Uh, the United States was cracking down on communism all over the world. By 1960, the United States was fighting for our hearts and minds in Asia, Africa, Latin America. And right. explicit segregation didn't look the same as it did in 1948 to the powers right. that be. So right. there was a lot more leverage. Uh, and it, it, the moral case against segregation and Jim Crow was just as strong in 1876, 1890, 1948, or 1960. But it's politics and the balance of forces and so on that meant that that breakthrough came in, 19, in the 1960s. And then you get the 1964 Civil Rights Act Nixon. and the 1965 <laughs> Voting Rights Act. Do you, right, right, right. Do you we're, think we're living through one way to look at the Trump era? is what we're living through is the most intense phase of the 60-year backlash that's yeah. been uh, the think... main driver of U.S. politics since 1965, is, is 68, 69, into the 70s, has been the backlash against the gains of the 1960s, uh, the end of Jim Crow, end of racist immigration quotas, modern women's movement, LGBTQ movement, anti-Vietnam War movement, all of that comes out of the 1960s, and there's been one stage after another of the backlash against that, from yeah. Nixon's Southern strategy through Reagan and neoliberalism and through birtherism, and uh, and now we're facing uh, MAGA, which you know has all those things in its gun sights. It What's amazing to me about that an analysis, and sorry, Gareth, is that no one, it feels like no one, no Democrat lays it out that like that. Hey, we've just been in backlash this whole time because there, it doesn't, it feels like they've been participating in the backlash and they have been paving the road for the backlash, capitulating to the backlash. So even the backlash wants a back scratch. Like it's all about just like making the backlash not feel like exactly what it is, which is what you're saying, that generational backlash to all of the gains here we are in the last gasp it's like it feels like you know the villain the hand comes out of the whatever the mud he's still alive he's crazier than ever he's got like one eye you know uh, q q is god like whatever and we've got it we're, <laughs> we've got a, this is just a shoe and we're hitting it um but gareth i want to give you a chance to jump in you, you well i just worry that um you know, that we're unable to like I, in my lifetime, Occupy Wall Street was really the kind of felt like the culmination of actually there was a real movement. It felt like something was going to change. And Obama felt very much like the candidate who was going to kind of bring in that change through the system, through the two party system. Right. It was the last time that I really felt like political hope and the disappointment of that time and of that presidency in a lot of ways is what has kind of turned me to this place where I feel like a lot of it is more performative than anything. And I think you're right that there are a lot of, there's a lot of infighting, which is, you know, it has to do with the system kind of failing, failing voters over and over again. But I feel like they are so good now at allowing performance over action 
in a in a system where there's like a media that just does total avoidance on issues that actually matter that's, that i worry so like true. i don't know i don't know where this next moment comes from i feel like people really are so bought into the two party system the way it's kind of constructed and and i and i know what you're saying like there are like little victories that that go on here and there but i think when you look at like what the Green New Deal was. The Green New Deal was like saying, there's no time for this shit. Yeah. And I just don't know how much more, you know, when you see Joe Manchin having the ear of Biden as much as Bernie Sanders or more, I don't, I, 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 that's where I go. I don't know where, if we have a breaking point, and even if we do have it, I don't know if we have people on the inside who are going to listen and help. Yeah. Well, look, let's face it, we're in a lot of trouble. Uh, yeah, it's and, just very uh, the, we're we're in we're in a lot of trouble, uh, and we're in a lot of trouble because we do not have we squandered. Uh, we did our best during the period from the late nineties, uh, from the early nineties into the present. People built protest movements. People did a lot of good work against the uh, globalization, the Seattle demonstrations. The, uh, the, against the Iraq war, but we, uh, the left didn't try to build a political machine to contend for power, including in the electoral arena. And meanwhile, the right wing was doing what it was doing, laying the groundwork for exactly where they've gotten uh, in terms of the whole way that the Republican party has been transformed into essentially a fascist party. That didn't happen overnight. That happened over 20 years. Of uh, uh, since Newt Gingrich and all the stuff in the 90s, uh, one wave after another. And of course, the mainstream Democrats, like you said, they were complicit. Uh, they, they, but it, we have to understand some of the reasons they were complicit. One reason they were complicit, they had a better sense of the danger from the right than we did. Mm. I think a lot of the left was ignoring what was going on mm. in the Republican Party for the last 20 years. Uh, and that was a mistake. Uh, hmm. So that doesn't mean we shared the values of those Democrats, but we have to understand some of the reasons they behaved the way they did. It's not that they're total idiots or that they are all just waiting to pounce on the left. They're bought and paid for uh, by certain interests, and their main interest is to win elections. Um, yes. So we have to build up enough strength to be able to make that difference. Uh, Occupy, there's a direct Occupy uh, to the totally. more progressive parts to Bernie's campaign and the more progressive parts of Biden's program. Yes, uh, and, I, I that. it took ten years. Uh, it, you know, the, but it, it also what, that's what happens. It takes time for that to happen. But it also, again, was also kind of not extinguished, but it was manipulated again, and it it. it you know, again, I mean, the difference being this point in history is that there's not enough time to fuck around with the with that stuff. Like it, Bernie, again, was totally a moment where it was like, holy shit. I mean, that one of my favorite moments was watching people on MSNBC melt down when it looked like Bernie was going to beat Biden for the nomination. It was remarkable, yeah. you know. And yet again, it was another moment that sort of was they were able to kind of siphon it in a direction where it was it's again, a long a walk it's a long yeah. walk to freedom okay gareth uh to quote but we're Mandela. like wiley it's coyote long... walking on the air <laughs> over the cliff now and we don't we have just yeah are, we don't have no more time. cliff it's true and i do want to say though that going to your book max and this compilation written by grassroots organizers about strategy surrounding the 2020 election you the in the intro there it's very moving because i think you name the ways that um coming in the 90s and early 2000s when you're talking about the lack of building a, a like a actual power apparatus and a structure there was a rejection of electoral politics largely like they're not looking out for us we have to look out for ourselves we don't want anything to do with that two-party corrupt system. Um, and then you have this line in this intro which says the unacceptable cost of ab abstentionism. 
evidenced by the Trump administration. It is unacceptable to relinquish the electoral arena. Um, and instead, how can we turn these low propensity voters, as you all write, into high propensity and, and high potential voters that come out every single electoral cycle that are a force to be reckoned with? So maybe talk about how electoralism has become so much more relevant and how the grassroots organizations that and the leaders that you had write chapters of this book, like, how are they doing it different? How does it, how is it not the sort of play by play, run of the mill, D triple C stuff? Well, one of the, uh, one of the aspects of having a systemic critique of capitalism and the way the political system is to recognize that the people who are embedded in it and who've grown up into it and have played by those rules, we expect every goddamn thing that they do. We know they're going to manipulate. We know that mm. per be performative. That's part of the game. That's their mm -hmm. politics. So I'm past being angry about it. It's just like the air we breathe. Yeah. There's no, you know, there's that slogan that people said, we are the ones we've been waiting for. There isn't anybody that's going to come along to save the constituencies we care about that doesn't come out of a different kind of politics than what's basically how you function in today's American politics. Mm -hmm. We have to build up our movements to the point where we have to play in, the, in on that terrain. We can't mm -hmm. storm the uh, Winter Palace from the outside. That's not going to work in a country like the United States where the majority does politics through elections. It nearly did for the right though, which I believe it was Michael Moore recently pointed out, like he was like, y'all, we know we were jealous, right? Everyone on the left was a little jelly of like how far the Capitol well, rioters like, got. If, they, if only they were doing it over rational over things <laughs> no that shit. mattered. Instead they were like, <laughs> they took our president. It was like, do it for health care, you exactly. idiot. <laughs> Absolutely. We, and it's not strictly an electoral thing. Uh, we should go back and look at the way the right uh, conquered power. If you go back to look at Bush versus Gore, the Brooks Brothers riot outside of the Broward County where the vote counting took place. <laughs> yep. This was not strictly an electoralist, legalist strategy on the right wing side. They did plenty of grassroots mass action of their kind. And but they always the funded by billionaires, Mac. This is my thing. We don't the have the billionaires. They went where the counterpart to the left, which tries to rebuild the labor movement, tenants unions, and all kinds of other popular organizations. The right wing went after the white evangelical churches in the starting in the 1970s and turned them into a, real, a mass or a politicized mass organization of the right. So we have to build that kind of political power. We should do that with Scientologists. <laughs> that should be we have plan. to build that kind of political power. And as we build that political power, we have to keep our arms open because there are people from within the system who are going to turn to the left. That's always happened, too. If you go back to look at before the Civil War, at a certain point, the, it's not only the abolitionists and the left who won that war, they became, uh, they built enough political power and moral high ground that a bunch of people came over to their side. That's what radical republicanism was all about, which produced the biggest change, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, which yeah. we're still standing on today, which are hovering on the edge of extinction in today's sure. Supreme Court. But that was the most closest we came in this country to some kind of revolutionary change was the end of slavery and re reconstruction. So you ha we have to keep our arms open and recognize that there are going to be people within the system who they were within the system. And when something better looks like it's coming along, we'll welcome them into it. But it's They want to be on the right side when we're winning. It, Everyone exactly, wants to be on the right side when we're winning. Exactly. But we have to build that up. And that's what we that have to book, win. That book was about those formations that are trying to build, they have a power building strategy. They try to integrate electoral work with year round campaigning with the idea over time, they're going to 
have their own people be elected for office who actually come out of their movements and who are connected to them. Lucha in Arizona is one of the chapters uh, formed after 2010 when Arizona was in the center of anti-immigrant work, uh, the anti-immigrant movement in this country uh, by young Latinos. And over time, through a whole series of campaigns, uh, including getting rid of Joe Arpaio at Maricopa okay. County, the racist sheriff Victor. like that, they built up power. Now, they flipped Arizona, turned it into purple, elected some Democrats. But in this last round, they also elected 10 or 15 of their own people to various offices within the state. And Arizona was a key battleground. And it's a big thing that they defeated uh, those two election denialists who were running for Secretary of State Fincham and, you know, our Carrie Lake, uh, who's the main, uh, you know, was being touted as the best heir to Trump. She's got a lot more charisma than Ron DeSantis. If she had won the governorship in Arizona, we'd be in a different political landscape right now. Right. So, I mean, I think uh, 20 she did win. Let's I, we got to right. count the votes first, Max. Let's get yeah. all the votes counted. I mean, that I think is is huge. Seeing the the way and I, I hope media and mainstream Democrats. Instead of capitulating, well, I guess people just want fascism, seeing the way 2022 and the midterms bore out that. No, they don't. <laughs> they don't even even. Yes swing suburban voters who I know that your book and, and our, the left should not be focused on, but it's like, yeah, no, even those guys, even they're the people who are usually catered to by the D triple C and Democrats, they don't want that they're gettable. And so, um, anyway, I wish that the Democrats would sort of like plant their flag on this victory ish of the 2022 midterms and grow and build on it and, and do more. And we'll see what's to come in 2023. Um, I, I guess I wanted to ask you, um, I mean, yeah, you didn't really answer my question, Max. And I just kind of want to call you out on that. Uh, but you (laughs) no, I guess what, what do we have to look forward to 2023? We've lost the house. Democrats have lost the house, but, how do you keep the energy electoral energy up when we might be lo- moving into a presidential election in 2024 between Biden and Trump again? Uh, there are some things we can control and some things we can't control. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to build organizations on the ground that are in touch with people year round that fight for their interests. And to the extent they get elected or they get people elected, they have to deliver for those interests. They have to Mm -hmm. deliver the goods, whether it's at the city level, the state level or the federal level. And they have to be, when when they're not in a position to deliver, they have to still be seen as integrated into those communities and as the biggest champions for those communities' rights and material interests. We're not gonna be able to do that on the scale of hundreds of millions because our organizations are not strong enough, but they are strong enough to do it on the scale of several million people in key states. And we have to do that. We also have to hope that the broader messaging about the danger of MAGA and the Mm -hmm. potential of a different kind of governing coalition uh, resonates with enough people uh, that we can hold off uh, MAGA for another two two or four years. The problem we have, and this, no one has an easy answer to this. If we don't build up the strength of the, okay, progressive current, the rooted progressive current, to a whole different level than it is now, we're gonna be fighting one defensive election after the next. We'll be permanently in that place. And when you're fighting that way against fascists, all you have to do is lose once. All you have to do is lose once. And if the fascists are then in power, you're stuck for a generation. So we- I mean, look at the Supreme Court. I feel like we're already stuck. I can't, I mean, and I, 
We yeah. need to have enough governing power to change the, the, the rules of the game. Maurice Mitchell, yeah. head of the Working Families Party, often says we need enough power in the rigged system to unrig it. We've got to have term mm -hmm. limits on Supreme Court or we've got to pack the Supreme Court. We've got yeah. to change the Electoral College. We have to re get the Voting Rights Act back. All of that requires getting enough power within a rigged system to unrig it. Yeah. Why um, it becomes so deflating in many ways, too, is because when you look at Biden running, Biden said a lot of things as a candidate that were extremely appealing to people who are, uh, you know, very on the left. There were a lot of things that, you know, I personally felt like, well, I mean, shit, if he does these, it's also what Trump did to get elected. I mean, Trump said a lot of things that were speaking to the, yes, the failed policies of the system that he was kind of running against. But when Biden was saying it, there were all these things that were you were sort of going, well, look, if he does 80 percent of this, he could be an extremely progressive candidate. Yeah. It's that you then watch it in action and you go there, you know, they as they always do, they they forget about what they promised. Right. And, and he's design. a terrible figurehead. He's a terrible figurehead for the entire party. I'm sorry. Like, like, y yes, there have been wins and victories. Yes, there have been some good stuff. But he's a terrible head of this party. He's just not he's not good. And the ones who are Bernie and someone like AOC or other members of the squad, they're always they're like, you know, you'll get your turn. It's like the understudy is better than the, the main actor. Right. And you're like, man, can we just get a moment? Can you yeah. use the progressives? to their advantage, because I guarantee you, if you give some members of the squad the opportunity, sure, there'll be online lefties who are like, they've sold out, but if you give them a role, if you, AOC said it, she was like, why wasn't I deployed more in the midterms? If you wanted to win in certain counties, you know, uh, districts, deploy me, I'm, I'm down to travel, I'm down to rally. It's like, and they don't, right? So their best kept weapons, their, be their best weapons are kept, you know, whatever. Under on wraps the bench. on the bench, exactly. Thanks yes, for all the metaphors. They're hostage to a certain way of looking at the world that doesn't correspond to the way the world is now. Mm -hmm. But the only way to beat them, the only way to do that, if you, you, we have to look at Bernie. Bernie has the right strategy, but it ideologically appealing, which is his his whole campaign in 2016 and 2020 was. We have to motivate those voters who've been neglected by both parties, who have an interest in fighting the system, and we have to get them to turn out and vote and make the political revolution. I think mm -hmm. Bernie has some weaknesses on how he deals with race and gender, but as far as that goes, he had the right idea. Yeah. Yeah. The fundamental reason that Bernie did not win in 2016 or 2020 was not that there was a conspiracy on the part of the centrists to keep him out. Of course they wanted to keep him out. That's a given. The reason is the infrastructure underneath him was not yeah. strong enough in those communities to turn those people out. He did not, he came from one of the whitest states in the country. He had no yeah. track record. On, on key issues in the black community in the South, face to face with Jim Crow, they made the safe choice, what they thought was the safe choice. We can disagree with that, but until sure. you have that infrastructure, until you're there year in and year out, until you visited the churches, until you have people on the ground, you it's very difficult. You know, we, we, we have a critique of the system that says, it throws people away, it alienates people, it exploits people, it grinds them down. Everything about that is true. And then we seem to think people, some people on the left think if you show up one time with a good leaflet or a good internet vibe that says, hey, we're for you, we're against the system, somehow yeah. people are going to get behind you right away. I mean, if you have a good podcast and it's live and you've got good guests, exactly. I mean, I just... That's just not po serious politics. And Bernie didn't wasn't that simplistic, but he was re he he it hadn't been built enough. That's sure. not Bernie's fault. You have to also beat the refs. I mean, to stick with a sports analogy, you have to be able to overcome the refs. That is how I mean, and I think that is and to what you're saying, I think is so true. 
it's just so frustrating when it feels, um, you know, like you're stuck in the, one of the things I found so appealing about AOC was she was like, you need to be willing to not get reelected. Mm. And then it feels a lot of times like that has not necessarily been, you know, what, what they're not, they're not, you know, going for it all, <laughs> all the time. It has become a bit more of a long strategy. And if you were maybe brought into that a little bit more, um, Again, if you felt like you had a cell in the Democratic Party a little bit more, a unit that really did try to hold things hostage, that would probably really get more people um, believing in, in that there is something to vote for because Bernie was able to motivate a lot of non-voters. Right. And, and, and it's a line because you, you can't alienate the, a victory, right? And... Um, throw away something that might be successful, like voting yeah, no. Right. If, if I don't think AOC would have voted no on the omnibus if it didn't have a chance of passing. I just don't think she would have done that. It was totally. a safe it was a safe no vote. So it's always that strategy. Um, I love the way strategy. Max... It is a strategy. And Max, everybody, you can tell why he's my mentor. You can tell why that you should definitely buy the book Power Concedes Nothing. And you should buy his original, his uh, Revolution in the Air book. Um... But it's because he's always like comes on is like, oh, I'm sorry. Are you brand new to this decades long struggle? <laughs> and and it and it always speaks to me as someone uh, much younger, but who was politicized before the Obama moment and sort of I've been seeing a lot of Obama not to call you out, Gareth. But you just said, you know, like the I think the Obama energy has been probably one of the biggest like letdowns um in our lifetime of feeling like he didn't actually deliver on a lot of things but we all knew i knew he wouldn't you know what i'm saying so but <laughs> but i like that we can't we don't we can't afford to act brand new to this struggle we have to get over our feelings about the sellouts and about um the the long road and about the work and we have to kind of like buckle buckle in and because we don't have time, as I think we've pointed out before. Let me, um, let me, uh, yeah. let me, I know we're trying to Please. wrap up, but let me make one hopeful comment Please. here. Please. We were very lucky to have a Bernie Sanders. I mean, who carried the ball for the progressives in 2016 was an old white guy from one of the whitest states in the country who had managed because of that a Jew. to have a perch in U.S. politics and have enough legitimacy and off keep his politics to go out there and campaign in 2016. Yep. One of the fruits of that turn, indirectly, if you look at the squad, the racial and gender composition, and where those folks come from and the communities yep. that they're rooted in is much more the base that has to turn out to make change in the United States than where Bernie came from. Not to of take course, anything yes. away from Bernie. That, that's where he was. I'm you know, very grateful for him. So when you, I agree very much about with what you're saying, Gareth, about a cell within. The, I might not use the word cell, but a, a cohort. It's probably within not the, the best party. term. Yeah, but the cohort within the Democratic Party that is really developing a new generation of leadership, and that does have roots in the progressive movement. We're a lot further along on that now than we've been in a very, very long time. In a yes. very, very long time. There are some really talented people in electoral politics at different levels, in labor organizing at different levels, and in community power building, some of these state-based power building organizations that are covered in the Power Concedes Nothing book. That layer of people are in their 30s and their 40s. A few of the older ones might be in their early 50s. That's the age, right? That's the sweet spot right now for yeah. what's going to be the next generation of political leaders. And if we can stave off the threat from MAGA, I think there are really good prospects. Some of those folks are going to be exactly what you're talking about in terms of being able to play the kind of roles that we need if we're going to yeah. move this country in another direction. I mean, we we, we got to wrap, but I also have to say, like, I think the we're running out of runway comment that Gareth you made. And I think people are pointing out and, you know, critiques of incrementalism 
It means more street movements. I mean, it does. It means more Occupy Wall yeah. Street. It means more Black Lives Matter movements. And it means they're going to come harder and faster and be more, um, you know, people are going to be conflicted about them. They're going to be militant. I hope they exist. And they're going to need our help. They're going to need our leadership. They're going to need our strategy. They're going to need, you know, all of that. So like, ooh, baby, it's coming. You know what I mean? I think there, there will be more. A general strike at some point, some version of something like that, that actually does show people that there is power uh, in the hands of workers. Yeah. Is, and again, they've made it so difficult to pull that off because everybody is living so paycheck to paycheck. Sure. To but paycheck. look at how much, look at the year 2022. It's the year of labor, right? It, look at how much more popular yeah, it is to talk about labor rights than it was yep. just a few years ago. So speaking of wanting to jump on a winning train, and why am I using the analogy? Because ironically, Congress voted to fuck over the railroad union, you know, and workers, but they got hammered for it. I mean, this could have gone under the dark of night, but it became national conversation what happened to the railroad workers. And yes, it wasn't a victory, but the victory to me was the the dialogue around it and 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 electeds knowing <laughs> they are not that we'll remember it um what a way to end the, this 2022 year of labor is by having congress to to kill that strike or yeah preemptively kill it but max elbaum I love you so much. You're so wonderful. People in the chat love you. We got a record number, uh, not a record, but you know, a great number of people watching. Um, and just uh, Burning Bush Dragon says, thank you, Mr. Elbaum, for coming on today. We appreciate you. Um, Cap Vic Solo says, thank you, Uncle Max. Um, Marshall Ghetto saying, Max would have been one of my mentors if I went to school near him. Well, Max travels. That's the other thing. He's portable. So uh, he can still be your mentor from afar. Don't also, take Southwest when you do, Max. Yeah, as long as you. Um, and Marshall Ghetto also adding, damn right, we tried in Seattle. And just a lot of love um, and a lot of good comments. Daniel Lee saying, the actual left has been screaming about fascism for 20 years. And the Democrats ignored it. Yes, everyone has receipts. Um, and um, let's see. Jesse Drink says, continue to continue the sports reference, the team owner is paying the coach to bench the star players so they keep losing. I mean, yeah, then there's also True. that. Then there's that. Uh, but, and I think this has been mentioned, we didn't talk about climate change. I do think at a certain point, I mean, you talk about the pocketbook pulling all the strings, it's not going to be financially beneficial, nor is it still or already to ignore the climate crisis. So that money is going to have to move because, you know, there's not enough seats on the spaceship to Elysium or wherever the fuck the rich are going. Not they're not all invited. Yes, that's including you, Southwest CEO. You're not on the spaceship, so you're gonna have to start lowering those goddamn prices. No, and we're run by cokeheads who <laughs> don't think about how to do cocaine for the rest of their lives. They just want a bag for the night. I mean, it, and it is like, how much longer are you gonna sit in the passenger seat while this is going on? But they don't. They all they think about is. It's quarterly, quarterly mentality. Yep. And that does not behoove the next hundred years in any metric. No, not even the next 20. Um, Max Elbaum, thank you so much for coming on. You're so wonderful. And um, a pleasure have, to meet you, Max. Milwaukee. Happy New Year. Pleasure to meet you, Gareth. And it's always great to see you, Francesca. And we just got to avoid the Lily Tomlins, uh, you know, what she said about world she said we're the planet of the slow learners and we better hustle up because we're not going to be around much longer if we don't we need a lily up. tomlin david o russell freak out moment is what we need yeah yes oh my god love lily breakfast. tomlin that is a deep cut um all right max take very good care thank you so much and gareth oh i just moved the camera he's gone wow. goodbye Gee, yeah it's like the weakest link you've got the power to just sort of <laughs> farewell forever welcome to the show uh if you're listening yeah. to the podcast yeah we just we just deleted max from the stream we, we did nothing i'm just here oh yeah you no. did this you you willed it i don't think that's fair i uh, why did you take max out 
you this you're doing this for the it's because aud- he was no. talking too much he didn't let you jump no, in enough, huh? listen i was scrolling at the bottom it keeps talking about the frantifa it's not talking about the garmy, so, <laughs> the garmy. we know whose world we're in the Garmy lame. Frantifa, Frantifa beats Garmy, please. Garmy For is all a you winner. Gareheads. The Milligary. <laughs> We're gonna figure it out, and it's going to be related uh, the to Milliga- the Milligary. The Milligary, definitely. Milligary. Yeah versus i mean they we're talking about our little like street gangs you know it'll when the left just turns into the warriors movie the gare force gare force is good I gare force milligary <laughs> this will happen but you know what needs to happen very very quickly is i'm like do we have enough time hmm i don't know if, we have a final segment guys and it is all about the best and by best, I mean worst, of course. A new master class, y'all. Gareth, I don't know if you've ever taken a master class. I don't even know I if have. you've had a master cleanse. Um, if that I've not had. I took a master class on the master cleanse. Oh, very good. So Thank you. there's a new addition to the master class, and it's part of their presidential sort of lineup um, on how to be president, how to be a leader. And this one is being authored by none other than the bold within reason. George Ugh. W. Bush, bold Ugh. within reason. Bold within reason is an amazing term. Amazing term. Bold, bold within reason. Within reason. You got to invade two countries, but be quiet about the third. Ugh. Okay, so here we Ugh. go. You called it. And daring an application. <laughs> Look at that it's twinkle, just, though, Gary. Look at the twinkle just... in his eye. Can His you old... ma- can you believe it's it's unfathomable that he is allowed to be in public, <laughs> let alone <laughs> the gall to be like he's going to teach you how mm-hmm. to lead. Yep, this yep. happened, guys. Trump is the best thing to ever happen to George W. Bush. Without the best question. Fuck, like we could not have imagined. And no, this isn't a I miss it's Bush. Like, Fuck those people. But it's like a, it's a penisless man taking the heat off a premature ejaculator. Okay, okay. Wow. Is that too much? <laughs> I don't know. Never, never for this show. Never too much. Okay. Look at that twinkle. Here's the thing about Bush. He had such a fucking brand oh. new baby twinkle in his eye that you're like, <laughs> I killed. I killed hundreds of millions of people in the Middle East, but look at that twinkle. And uh, I didn't mean to. My bad. It was My what bad. we call an international oopsie poopsie. <laughs> My bad. Here we go. The forty third president very of the United few States. People watching this will become president, but I think you'll find lessons in leadership that will apply to your life. <laughs> what? Stupid. Oh God. Man. Oh God! By the way, now there's and just Laura a push. Madeline, just a, I mean, it's like a panel of war criminals. A panel of war criminals. I realize few of you will get to be a war criminal on an international stage, but maybe is, in your own lives, you what could. What is Laura Bush teaching? <laughs> is she is she part of his, or is she teaching her own? Gareth, behind every war criminal is a strong <laughs> crime uh, wife. Uh, President, uh, sometimes uh, I had information that the American people didn't know, and therefore I had to make decisions. <laughs> but- oh, like what, sir? I'm sorry, quick follow up. Like what? What did you, I'm sorry, what did you, did you know it was all a lie? Is that, did, was it, was it information because it was just that how you to made continue up? reading a book about a puppy when they tell you that the Twin Towers are ablaze from planes and act surprised, act surprised about it, even though. You and Dick Cheney did not appear separately in the 9-11 commission interviews. You had to do it together because you wanted to get your story straight. Oops. Okay. That's a lesson in leadership. Bring Dick everywhere. (laughs) Uh, What does he know that we don't know? Is he about to admit? You know, when you do 9-11, I'm sorry. Can we take that again? You know, when you did it like when he did that with Ukraine and he said Iraq, he's like, yeah. When he said Iraq on accident instead of yes. Ukraine. And then he says if Iraq. We did that too. with 9 11 here. That would be yeah. amazing. He's like, well, we did the, the country on, <laughs> on knowledge that wasn't evident. That's just the nature of leadership. 
So what? long as you're Did guided you by principle, and so long what? as you're that guided by statue looked like zombie. a cause greater than self, you can endure criticism because it's going to come. One of the things I missed after the presidency was this daily learning, and thankfully painting came into my oh life. My oh my God! Fuck. George W. Bush crew neck fuck sweater, me. painting his fucking Stop. heart out. This Stop. he should be in a prison cell doing this. I am fine he with him doing painting this with feces on a prison wall. <laughs> Instead, he's got his own little studio. <laughs> oh, God. It's so bad, Gareth. Look but at him. But he also, one of the things he's them. teaching, it's insane. It's, it's <laughs> absolutely insane. He's gotten better ones. I got to say, and I'm like, I'm going to stick up for his artistic talents. The, what, the, there's a smattering of them behind him right now. And they're they're just like someone, a kid looked at Van Gogh and then How great would it be it. if it was just all like bloody war depictions, yeah. just like his nightmares of just what he's done. But he also in this is saying one of the things he'll teach you is how to deal with criticism, mm -hmm. which is like, well, that's because you're a war criminal. Like, that's not like a leader. You killed a hundred million Iraqis. So he's like, you get, boy, did I learn get a pissed lot. off at you. I'm, I'm going to teach you how to avoid those questions. No, how to know when a boot's coming your way. I'm going to teach you how to duck that boot. How to duck a boot or two. <laughs> it's a learning experience because with every paint stroke, you learn something new. Oh, God. I'm going to do another flower. It's important <sighs> to have a set it's of not priorities. Okay. I think this we're is... in hell. I think I think we're in hell, it's, Gareth. It, I don't. It I would think be we... like Jeffrey Dahmer having a cooking show. <laughs> I never thought I would. I just. Eight years it's, of this, but I had to endure eight fucking years of this. I was in college during the Bush years. Uh, Bush, the Bush years, like, like totally politicized me. Yes, and and having to see this shit, At having least, him him saying another nice flower. <laughs> Happy cloud. That guide you and your team, your company, your managers have got to understand those priorities. To me, the most important priorities oh were my faith in my family and my friends. That may sound corny to some, but it yes. helps you reorganize the rest of your life. Welcome, Darren. Thanks. Great. Glad to be here. Oh. When I was speaking to audiences, I didn't want them to think I was smarter than they were. One of the keys they, they didn't. to communication is <laughs> to figure Nobody out thought how they to were enable the person you're talking <laughs> oh you oh so i know sometimes uh it was all an act you know what i'm saying i was pretending that's why to I be said, dumb that's why i said uh, fool me twice fool me can't get fooled again because i didn't want anyone to think i was uh einstein <laughs> or is it <laughs> feinstein i forget you know I, hey I was look at this dog the malaprop misunderestimate the press corps reaction was did the guy really just say that <laughs> what? I remember like, the guy really it's estimate. Not like he was speaking. You know, I had I was a master at the Malaprop. Misunderestimate. Malaprop? The press corps reaction was the guy really just say that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So not, are you gonna learn how to mispronounce yes. words well, so that you people think you're a good leader because you're not smarter than they are and so you're gonna misread the prompter and say miss under like is he trying to rewrite his history of being a fucking idiot he, what he's trying to do because the people at master class were like we can't possibly do this because there's nothing this man should be teaching he now is telling you that if, if he's able to figure out how to be charming through his idiocy which is like, well, why would an idiot be teaching a master class? And he's like, I don't know, but here's a flower. <laughs> That's a class. It's a class on how to be an idiot and also a leader at the same time. Like how to be president twice and be really stupid. <laughs> I remember right after 9-11 in the Oval Office talking about Celebrate. praying for families that had suffered loss. I broke down in tears. If your heart is touched, let people know that your heart is touched. Not everybody is going to be a leader, but everybody can end up being a better person. The challenge of life is not to attain wealth and status and power. The challenge of life is to improve and to learn to love better. And uh, everybody can do that. Oh, man I'm George W. Murderer. Bush. And this is Masterclass. No, absolutely it, it really, not.
the world's best. The world's best. What are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? This is, it is <laughs> the lack of accountability. I, you know what I feel? It's like, maybe it's like really like, there's some dad issues here, but he makes me feel, and I feel like our entire generation feel like he is an abusive dad on his deathbed going, like rewriting his history. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, dad. I, like, I, hit, you're like, I hit you. I hit you to show that I, I was rewarding you. He's like, and I, I just, I just want to, you know, I, I learned to love. And that's what I did. It was like, you stole all our, or like our family's money. You spent yeah. my college you savings you, on beer, on your it, man cave. And it, you're just it, like, <laughs> it's like, what, like master class, what happened? Because <laughs> they did, there were things that were relevant. Like, I mm. think they just ran out of people. They eventually were just like, look, there's like a hundred people who are really good at shit that'll do this. And then they were just like, well, what do we do? We got to get some, we got to make some splashes. <laughs> and then they got like. They're doing it for like this it, moment. It's virality, you know? You know, Dick Cheney should teach one on how to have a good heart. <laughs> exactly. That would be next. Uh, he has the heart of a gator. It is an alligator. <laughs> it is. I mean, he has no heart. It's it's just like a fucking, it's a robot. Um, You guys, we have to go because there is more to talk about. In the bonus, Bish, we're going to talk about two very fun moments. Russia has a new strategy for boosting morale on the front lines and you have to watch this f-35 try to land i, I want to all watch that together patreon.com slash situation room to get that content we're going to do 10 minutes it'll be super short and sweet gareth reynolds thank you for joining me on this show where thank can people find me. you and your new special where where can the Garmy go? Uh, the Garmy can go to my website, which is, uh, yeah, no, no, the Gear Force can go to GarethReynolds.com and there's a special link there. You can follow me at social media at Reynolds Gareth and uh, listen to the dollop. And then we have a live virtual dollop January 12th. All um, right. Go to dolloppodcast.com for all that. Live virtual. We have a new podcast called The Pastimes, The Dollop Sidecar. Um, are you serious? I, I mean, actually, I think I did know that. I was like, what's this? And I haven't had a chance. Yeah, to it's like a new-ish podcast, which is uh, totally crazy in its own right. But it's, a, I love it's, it. like a, it's like a different little dollar. So, But you can go watch my special, England Weed and the rest. It's on YouTube, but you can get a special link at GarethReynolds.com. Um, but we, we support you by paying for it, for correct? No, no. This is a free it's, special. It's free 99? Free. Go watch. Just go watch it and tell people. It's All right. Free. England, England Reynolds. weed and the rest. You'll never guess what I talk about. Wow. I'm so excited. I mean, not that I wasn't going to buy it. Uh, all right, everybody. Sound, I'll be honest. It doesn't sound like you were going to buy it. <laughs> I was like, it's wait, it's free? free? Okay, beep, boop, bop. <laughs> yeah, from the from what I'm gathering right now. No, it feels I like will that buy it. You're hurdle. doing you, my show no, for free. You cannot buy it. It's not even an option for you to buy it. Oh, God. You've been doing... You can't even uh, tip. You've given me your afternoon. Everybody... Gareth Reynolds, F find oh, wow. him. Oh, look at him on his website. He doesn't have any facial hair. Okay, bye, Gareth. Deleted. Um, and thank you guys for being here. Thanks so much for all of your support. Thank you to the super chatters and to the. Sorry, I'm just. I just assuming they're super chats. Eric Robertson says Max Album is a goat. Yup, um, he is. Fun P says I was at her Portland show. It was super fun. Hi, Fun P. Thanks for being here. Um, Todd Roy says I believe Gareth is the first guest without a bookshelf behind him yeah he doesn't read i don't know if you got that vibe but not a reader um and let's see jeff curry about george santos santos has nailed how to be a republican um freddie maldonado said where do you find this dude he's cute and funny i think you mean max album right definitely not gareth right gareth if you're listening you're cute and funny um and thank you, Robert, for your super chat. There we go. It rubs the corporate back money on its skin or it gets the hose, Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> Dude, I was going to make a Buffalo Bill reference because that's what it feels like. You know, when we get like a little breath of fresh air, it's like he just like lowered down a little bit of lotion. <laughs> that's exactly right. It rubs the corporate back money on its skin and it gets the or it gets the hose. Oh, my God. 
Um, Jeff Curry took a course on fishing. I'm now a master baiter. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, sorry, that was funny, actually. Uh, Sully, Ve Sully Vegan. I want a Dick Cheney master class on hunting humans. Um, yes, and Suburban Housewife reminding us, what if Hitler had been accepted into art school? Indeed, and George Bush reminds us of that as well. Support authoritarians artistic inclination inclinations if you have a kid who's a little bit of a gangus you know just make sure to support his or her dreams and just give him a paintbrush don't buy him a gun um all right and with that i want to thank everybody with the fart song thank you so much to the patrons at ten dollars or more star prudhomme what a name thanks so much to the big tippers there are none but tbr dash live on venmo tbr live on cash app you can tip the show to the new twitch subs smatty smat smat resubscribe for one month of tier one subscribe for four months why buy when we can rent and pay the military industrial complex to send limitless weapons? Hmm, that's so true. Um, it's yeah, it is like leasing a car. Uh, fat guy named Tiny resubscribing for one month of tier one. 19 months. Time flies when you're having fun. Always a blast catching you. What you're bitching about this week. Thank you, fat guy named Tiny. Thank you to the Jukesters for resubscribing at one month of tier one. Lizzie Nepon for resubscribing at one month tier one. And Portland Mary also resubscribe. And Kyle 8315 resubscribe or subscribe i don't know this show is a production of me Paige omek maximilian inhoff alexandra orness andy vasoyan we stream every tuesday 1 p.m pacific 4 p.m eastern on youtube and twitch follow the show on twitter at bituation pod tiktok and instagram at franny fio um also i stream the twitchuation room on tyt's twitch channel if you guys want the kind of science weird bizarre i talked about dolphin clits last time uh, it's very fun. Every Wednesday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. And remember, y'all, fight the power, fuck the patriarchy, and don't just bitch about it. Be about it. Bye.